Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast episode number 100. Woo! Look at this. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Popping champagne. Actually, it's very strong coffee tonight. I've got to drive home later. But... Yeah, no champagne, really. <laughs> I'm Dan Wood. I'm Ravi Abbott. And I'm Joe Fox. And of course, we had to get the full crew in tonight because we are celebrating the big 100. The retro hour goes triple digits. I didn't think we'd make double. Madness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to lay off the sound effects board in just a moment. But it is, of course, a celebration. I mean, this show, obviously, we've got quite a lot of celebrating coming up because we've got Christmas episode. Yep. Coming up. Then we've got our second birthday. Yeah. Straight after that too. And uh, of course, episode 100. Now, I have kind of been teasing over the last couple of weeks that we had someone very special lined up for our 100th episode. And it was a bit touch and go because you know, this person's quite hard to get hold of. Oh, we were very nervous in the studio, weren't we? Only managed to get this recorded last week. Yep. So after a yeah, couple of delays, we finally made it. If you read the episode title, I'm sure you know it is by now. We've got, I think it's fair to say, the father of video games. Totally. You know, he's just worked for so many companies that have been just amazingly pioneering in video games. And this guy's got ideas just flowing constantly. Yeah, I mean, he hasn't slowed down at all. No. And we are ca- talking about Nolan Bushnell, founder of Atari, guy behind the first ever coin-operated video game. Yeah, it's crazy. He, he kind of helped hand-build the first Pong machine. And it's just, I never thought we'd get to this stage that we're talking to the pioneers of video games, just yeah. full stop video what, games. What baffles me is that you guys just keep doing it every week. Every week, without fail, you've got just a bigger and better guest. I'm not saying, not to say that each guest is better or whatever, but it's just phenomenal the amount of amazing guests that you guys have had on the show. And out of 100 episodes, I think you've had 90, 98 guests. Yeah. I think there's only yeah. ever been two times you've not had a guest. Yeah. And that's, that was through a Christmas special and then through people asking to hear more about you guys. Yeah, yeah. So it's absolutely What's amazing. it been? Every week for two years Yeah, for two years in January. <laughs> yeah. 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 And well, next week, actually, it's good that you mentioned that because we thought we'd do a little kind of retrospective next week and mm. have a look back. I mean, it's obviously going to be quite hard to pick just half an hour's worth of our favourite from 98 guests. That's a lot of guests. It actually, is, really much that, yeah. 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 And the the amount is, of people Ravi's had to like pester on Twitter and stuff <laughs> is amazing. Well, everyone's fed up a Ravi by now. He's blocked half the gaming industry, blocked Ravi on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you, it's like fantastic that we're going to be doing this because we've got a lot of new listeners. And yep. they've probably not heard our older shows or heard these really interesting stories. Mm. And there's so many cool little picks. When we were picking clips, I oh. was just thinking, oh my God, I could do 10, I could do 20, you know. Yeah. So let's do the, the retro five hours next week. Yeah. We're, we're going to get it into an hour. Uh, but of course, first, Nolan Bushnell is going to be our guest on this week's show. Um, you know, I, I've got to say, it, I never thought we'd get to the stage where someone like Nolan Bushnell will come on our show, which is... It's you know, just it, mind-blowing. It's yeah. an honour, absolutely. It's something you dream of, isn't it? Absolutely. So uh, look forward to this one, guys. It's such a good interview as well. He's coming up on the Retro Hour podcast in around 25 minutes from now. And actually... We're celebrating a bit this week. I mean, you've got a little surprise for us in the studio. Yeah, we've got a, a nice looking cake that my mum's prepared for the retro hour. So I'm going to put a picture of this on Facebook. What What is the cake that your mum baked? <laughs> <laughs> You're probably wondering what console is that? Because it looks like a mix of many machines. But actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's an Amiga a retro hour edition. Uh-huh. Yeah. A very rare unreleased prototype Amiga. Which looks yeah. very similar to a botched PlayStation 1. Yeah, and it also <laughs> has Nottingham phrases in it, like, hey up me duck, and stuff bring, like that, on bring, the keys. I'm going to bring this over and try not to drop it on the floor. Yeah, there's some special <laughs> keys on there as well. I've got my name on there, I've got a smiley face. Yeah, she's a, she's an amateur cake maker, so she's just starting to get onto the kind of cake making Oh, vibe retro L100. Oh, well, yeah. thank, I imagine your mum probably doesn't listen to the show, but... Thanks. Oh, she does, yeah. Does she? Oh, really? Oh, there you go. Well, thanks, Ravi's mum. Really appreciate it. <laughs> you were going to put 100 candles in here, but the uh, health and safety and fire regulations... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sell the sprinklers <laughs> off, yeah. Get banned from the studio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll get stuck into that later, though. Lovely little surprise. We've actually had um, a few letters come in as well now. Oh, really? Well, I've done the letters section for a while, so... Oh, God, no. Uh, actually, I've got a few hand out of you chaps here as well, so you can see the picture. I always like this, because Dan holds them back, and it's like a big surprise oh, whenever oh, we see oh, them. Literally, yeah. every time he does this, it's like play days. It's yeah. just like, oh! I think he's real reactions. Whose birthday is it? <laughs> oh, I do want you, there are some topless pictures on the back. Oh, page. my God. Don't look at it. <laughs> Straight to it. Oh, it's a bloke. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you ever do want to get in touch, all you've got to do is email us, show at theretrohour.com. We've got a couple of lovely messages here congratulating us on our 100th episode. First of all, uh, Alicia Cuff, who's been in touch, she goes, hey, Retro Hour, hello from Canada. Congratulations on stepping up to three digits. I don't know if I've ever done 100 of anything I meant to. <laughs> she goes, anyway, I appreciate the show over these many months and consider you a major part of my education 
education in British micros and gaming scenes. Now, instead of just playing games on Spectrum emulators, she decided to challenge herself and using Jonathan Cordwell, who, of course, was on the show, his arcade game designer kit and a few tutorials as well. She's actually made her first Spectrum game in AJD. Oh, that is cool. And you know what? That's probably going to be ideal for going onto the Spectrum next. If she's starting to develop on that, yeah. Well, she's also said, I mean, if you look at this screenshot she's put in there as well, she's put a little secret area in there with a little wall of fame, and she's put the initials of folks who've been really influential in her making the game. And if you look right at the end there, the last set of initials is RH. Oh, there yes, we're, awesome. we're in a game, Dan. <laughs> so there you go. Because it's episode 100, she said she wanted the Retro Hour to be immortalised in at least one Spectrum game. So she goes, congratulations on 100. See you at 200. That's amazing. Thank you, Alicia. Yeah, that is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Look at us in a game. Yeah. <laughs> and next, we've got um, Robert Wheeler. He got in touch. He goes, uh, hey, Ravi and Dan, it's Amiga Rob in Nottingham here. Congratulations on making it to show 100. I've been enjoying them very much. I think you're both doing a very good job. Now, he's been listening to some of our older podcasts. He goes, uh, number 15, actually. Oh, wow. He's got Can a bit I of remember that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He'll hear this in about three years, then, probably. Um, and apparently, we were talking about like a Nokia phone on there as well. And essentially, he wants to know if he can get hold of a modern phone that's actually got a physical keyboard. Because he tried an Android phone the other day and said um, he couldn't get used to it. Oh, I think, I think maybe the Blackberries were the last ones that did really? that. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, no, there is that Nokia 3310 remake. Yeah, but, yeah I was I mean, going to say, you can still go into shops and get some crappy... Excuse my language. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I got told off earlier on because I swear too yeah, much. Potty, potty mouth. <laughs> and the potty mouth. Um, you can still get some... Feature phones, essentially, feature phones, though, aren't they? Yeah, but, but they're just kind of like, you always see these students with them who lose their phone every week on a night out. So. Well, there's got to be. I mean, <laughs> like I'm, there must be a market for it, I'd imagine. But then yeah. it's like, I'm sure there is some kind of like niche kind of product. But if anyone knows, um, drop us an email. We'll pass it on to Rob. Nice to hear from you. And uh, finally this week, uh, this is a picture you've been, you've been looking forward to, Joe. <laughs> uh, with William Fox. He goes, hey, guys, listening to the show while on holiday in Lanzarote for a bit of winter sun. Um, started listening to your show for a while. Just wanted to say... I've started donating as well. Much appreciated, William. Keep up the great work. He's going to send us some pictures of his retro collection. But first, we've got a couple of beach pics there as well. I'm jealous of that winter sun. <laughs> really really nice, freezing recently. And I'm jealous of that rug on his chest. I couldn't grow that. <laughs> oh, bless you should see my mate. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right. <laughs> I'm a yeti. <laughs> so thanks so much for getting in touch, guys. If you're going to get a mention in a future episode, all you've got to do is email us, show at theretrohour.com. Uh, speaking of getting mentions on the show as well, I mean, you know, we have made it to episode 100 now. We couldn't have done that without your very generous support. Now, um, obviously, this is completely optional, but we will say on every show, if you'd like to make a little donation into the running of it, it's going to allow us to keep doing this podcast throughout 2018 as well. Maybe get up to episode 200, hopefully. Do more live events next year as well, because we're planning some really big stuff next year. Oh, definitely. So uh, this all comes in really handy. If you'd like to make a donation, uh, any little donation however big or small, will qualify you for a place in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. All you have to do is nip onto our website, theretrohour.com, donate via PayPal. Yeah, you can do Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, lots Plenty of, of cryptos, yeah. So this week, I want to say thank you very much to Daniel Waddington. Ashley, Nara and then. Hakan Blumvist. And Gunnar Rivens, who all made donations into the running of the show at theretrohour.com. Well, we've got a little competition this week. Oh yeah, and this is for a cool event. They've got they've got some amazing performers. There's a guy called Ravi Abbott that's going to be doing really some, yeah. people off. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did last week, of course, have uh, Ian Simons from the um, uh, National Video Game Arcade in Nottingham, who's our special guest last week. We kind of mentioned it towards the end of last week's show. Yeah. Uh, but this week, and um, we've got a, a weekend pass to give away if you want to come down. So this is all your base. Now, this is a brand new video game music festival, and it's on the 19th and 20th of January. Here we go. <laughs> you want to be the player? All your base. 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 All your there's two options you can have here. One day ticket, which is £45, and a full weekend ticket, which is 80 And yeah. you're thinking, oh, that sounds quite pricey. There's a lot going it? on there. But there is a hell of a lot going on. So this 80 quid ticket, you get a live orchestral performance at the Theatre Royal. Not, uh, none of this kind of music, though. No, 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 no. This is... This is <laughs> live of, uh, orchestral, all our bass. <laughs> I was fighting that. Yeah. This is of Dear Esther, yep. which is... Absolutely amazing. I actually went to Birmingham recently with the Theatre Royal to see the preview of this show and just seeing live orchestral performance alongside someone playing a game. 
totally changes the atmosphere of the game and turns it into like a piece of entertainment. And then they've just got amazing people. They've got Chris Abbott coming. They've got Rob Hubbard. Yeah. You know, they've got a, I can never say his name, Maisaya Matsura. And he's the guy <laughs> that did Prapper the Rapper. Yeah. You know, Great that, soundtrack, that game. Oh, David Wise, who did Donkey, Donkey Kong yeah. Country. Mm. Um, there's the GoldenEye 64 guys there as well. The original Sony guy who did Wipeout. So this is a unique event. All the kind of time periods of video game music they're covering. Mm. And That's we're going to be awesome. hosting like essentially a live podcast, aren't we, on the, on the yeah, Saturday? Yeah, so, so on the Friday, there'll be a lot of events going on, performances. There'll be a big party on the night where we're going to be DJing and getting drunk. And then on Saturday, there's a panel stage and we're going to be kind of hosting all the panels in the daytime yeah. talking to some of these amazing performers and we're probably going to get a few on the show as well I'm sure I'm sure you'll bring some some kind of recording equipment yeah. if, if we can, <laughs> don't promise anything though based on our track record yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah I mean so now we, we've done Play Expo now and we love doing the live shows and this is just another one that we can do and it's in our hometown as well yeah local days and we, we've always said you know if you, we've had shows about Nottingham we've talked about the you know the amazing retro gaming stuff that goes on in this city so it's a good excuse to come here for a weekend as well and check out some of the other stuff as well while you're here totally and that amount of people yeah. for that much money I just think is a fabulous price Really. Well, you could come for free. Yeah. If you want to be our special guests. Yeah, there you go. And we've actually got a uh, pair of tickets to give away. So you and a friend or you and your other half, you can come along. Have a weekend in Nottingham. We'll get you into the events for free. So that'll get you in Friday and Saturday for free. Now, we're going to open this competition. Tell you what, being episode 100, we'll lay back. No question. We'll just put a form on our website. All you've got to do is head to theretrohour.com. Uh, you'll find a little form there on the front page. Fill in your details. We'll keep this open for what, about three weeks, do you think? Yeah, that's, that seems like a good good kind of time period and if you go to the nva.com forward slash all your base check that out because they keep adding people onto it every day i'm checking it i'm like oh he's coming my god better do some prep for questions yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll keep this open until the 29th of december at midnight uh, find that form and the terms and conditions at the retro hour.com and uh, if you are picked we'll get in touch and hopefully we'll see you there next month that should be fun right then before we get to nolan bushnell some new stories oh yes we've got to do the news still now, Sonic 3D Blast, do you remember that game? Yeah, I remember it. I remember it, um, I don't want to say fondly, but I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the one where he ran really slow and it was in like 3D. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the isometric, like top down kind of view for the Mega Drive. It came out on the Saturn as well, didn't it? Did it come out on the it Saturn. It was the only 3D Sonic game really but on the Saturn above. I, don't, Sonic I have no idea how it played on the Saturn, but it had like five frames. You know, per second kind yeah. of thing for per minute, probably. <laughs> well, it was meant to be the, kind uh, of Mega like, Drive. yeah. Well, the Sonic kind of swan song on the Mega Drive, really, wasn't yeah. it? You know, pushing the technical limitations yeah, and all definitely. that. It looked kind of like Marble Madness. A bit, didn't yeah, it? No, right, yeah, no, that's a really good reference actually for it. Or uh, is it Snake Rattle and Roll? Mm. Yeah, that one, that kind of isometric view. Um, kind of like with the grid and stuff. So, yeah, I do remember it. <laughs> well, it came out in 1996. I was seeing this very late for a Mega Drive game. Well, yeah, two years into the Saturn's life. So. Yeah, and obviously, around this time, you know, Sonic Extreme was getting developed at the same mm. time. This is the only one that made it to market. But um, John Burton was a guy who was behind it. He's obviously the, uh, the founder of Traveller's Tales. Mm. And he was one of the original developers on this game. But what he's done now is he's decided, which I think is really, really... You know, it's quite commendable, actually, that he's done this, bearing in mind the success he's had since then, like Lego and stuff like that, you know. But now he's gone back and actually looked at this game that he made, like, you know, over 20 years ago now. Yeah. And decided they can fix it up and make it better. Yeah. So he's gone back and he's done Sonic 3D Blast Director's Cut. Oh, yes, Director's Cut They're always better, aren't they? Well, he's gone through and essentially looked at all the bugs that he had in the code, mm. tweaked it, optimized it. He's took people's feedback on board about, you know, the, the bad controls in the game, mm. tighten them up so it plays a lot better now. Yeah. And he's just released this actually this week at the time of recording. So you can actually go on, download this for free off his website. He imagines, you know, you, you're going to have to run it on an emulator or yeah, an EverDrive yeah, or something course. like that. Yeah. You need the original ROM to play it. Yeah. But it will essentially really massively improve the original game. Really? So, wow, something we need to check out. <laughs> and they need to do that a lot more, I think. That that would be really well, cool if developers look back at I was going to say, I can't titles. imagine many developers would go back and look at their old work and think, oh, I'm going to tweak that for the fans. But no, that's really cool that he's done that. Well, he has a YouTube channel where, you know, he often kind of, um, it's called Game Hut. Yeah. Where he deconstructs his old games and mm. talks about them. But this is kind of the first time he's actually gone back and yeah. fixed up something that he did in the past. So... Yeah, I think that's awesome. You know, polishing up your 16-bit games for someone who's had the success he's had. He doesn't have to do that for the fans. No, exactly. No, that's yeah. what I'm saying. He doesn't have to go back and look at it at all. Now, like, they should just do that with Rise of the Robots. <laughs> <laughs> there are some jobs that are too big, I think, even, yeah. even for a development team. So but you never know. So if you want to download that Ramos ticket in this week's show notes at theretrohour.com. Here's an interesting little game. 
Baby Monkey Alba. Oh, this, Everyone's like, what? Yeah, this, <laughs> what? this looks Well, this cool. is, um, this was a game that was on the Nintendo Game & Watch. Okay. Have you ever seen one of those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You so, know our CEX in town is selling a lot of Game & Watches at the moment. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, saw that, I saw that the other week. How much? Uh, Around £20, £30 pounds yeah, for the... Yeah, they've, uh, got, they've got two, the one in Victoria Centre, hmm. which is our big shopping centre at the back of Nottingham. And uh, I thought it was interesting because of the, I was like, oh, they're constantly running. And then I looked it up and they, apparently they do constantly run. Oh, really? Yeah, but I back, don't know. But I've, never, I've never actually played them. I don't them. know. I just, they were in the window and they were just running like, you know, and I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Way before our time. Because they're black and white, aren't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They remind me of those, you know, the Tomy kind of games used to get. Well, obviously, they were, they were a bit more like fully featured games on yeah. these. So a lot of people think, oh, you know, whenever you talk about Nintendo, it's like, oh, the Game Boy was like the first one. But obviously, this no, Game came Watch, out. Yeah, because yeah, there was a little collecting scene, wasn't there, with the Game and Watch and stuff? That sort of, yeah, yeah, there's a good handful of them. I, I don't know how many there is, but. There is a good handful of like different gaming watches because obviously it was just one game. Yeah, you couldn't change the ROMs yeah, or anything yeah, yeah. in it. But this was, I mean, there's Donkey Kong Jr. was released on there, which is what this game is based off. Okay. Now, this is called, you know, it's actually quite, quite a weird concept. They've took a game and kind of recreated a um, Nintendo Game & Watch game and ported it to the ZX Spectrum. You know what? I didn't read anywhere that it was ZX Spectrum, but it had a proper ZX Spectrum <laughs> look look to it. Like I was just like, oh, interesting, because like, that looks nothing like Game & Watch graphics. Yeah, it's obviously got colour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, a, a bit anyway. But I think it looks really good. What I really like about it is... <laughs> if I can turn this up. Oh, yeah. It's actually the gorilla's Clint Eastwood. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, and, you yeah. know, and, and this is also uh, designed with AGD as well. Yeah, Jonathan Caldwell's. Yeah, engine, so, so this software, yeah. AGD, seems to be really helping the specy scene at the moment. But there you go, obviously the Spectrum Next, you know, has kind of reinvigorated the specy scene, mm-hmm. but I think, you know, that you couldn't get more obscure than a Nintendo Game & Watch game <laughs> ported to the Spectrum in 2017 with the Gorillaz music over it, but yeah. it's a free download, and if you want to check it out, there's um, a little link that I'll put in this week's show notes as well. Uh, I thought this was quite an interesting thread on Reddit. Do you remember back in the day, you know, I was reminiscing the other day about when you got home from school and you didn't have anything else to do, but you'd sit there and just play games all night. Yeah. All evening. Next day, you know, weekends, that'd be all you do all weekend long. Till your eyes bleed. <laughs> <That> was, <laughs> didn't have a care in the world otherwise, no, did you? You no. wish you had that time again. I'd finished games quite a lot when I was young. Yeah, unlike now. But I saw this thread on Reddit the other day. It was talking about games that you spent loads of time on and in the end they had really bad endings and you felt disappointed by. Oh, absolutely. So many. You know what really really grounds my gears though especially with the 16-bit era um, of all your beat-em-ups and you know your kind of you know one-on-one fighters and stuff and you side along platformers is the games with difficulty settings and if you completed them on easy or normal you wouldn't get like the last level you'd only get like the first six levels or something and then you go back and you're right okay you train and you play it on hard and you complete it and you get that Awful, awful congratulations scene, and you're like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but now can you do it on hard mode? <laughs> yeah, that's all you get, and then you do it no! on hard. You do it on hard, and all you get is a congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> but now can you play it again? <laughs> yeah, thank you for playing. Play that was again. the laziest cop out ever, wasn't it, by developers? Absolutely. But I mean, there's actually worse than that. I remember playing games that would literally, you get to the end, it just loop back to the start. Wouldn't even get a message. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But then also, do you remember with the PlayStation, they had a lot of stuff like, if you complete Lara Croft on this then you get a movie of her in the shower or if you do this on Final Fantasy you get a different ending there was a few RPGs like Mm. um, Final Fantasy 6 or 3 depending where you lived that had like I can't remember how many different endings but it had several different endings and Chrono Trigger had like 13 different possible endings so kind of those RPGs and you know those like action platformers towards the end of that kind of era you know, had a few more, but definitely early kind of Nintendo. Well done on the screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, those earlier kind of games, just a, a thumbs up. It's just like, oh, what? <laughs> like... Well, you, you were often lucky if it was spelt right as well, weren't you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the Sega here, Shinobi on the Sega Master System. The last boss was insanely frustrating to beat, and then you got a message popping up on the screen that said, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what ending I always enjoyed? Uh, Golden Axe, the Golden Axe 1 for the Mega Drive. Yeah. That just had a cast of all the enemies. Like, yeah, they, they'd just, run uh, in. but it had yeah. really good music. I always remember the music being fantastic. Like, yeah, like <laughs> it wasn't it a kid to play on the arcade and then they'd come out the screen or something. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. Yeah, on yeah. the arcade one they all come out of yeah, they all walk out of the side of the building, but on the Mega Drive one they didn't didn't couldn't reenact that, so it was just a black screen of them all flying on with like the characters' <laughs> names. <laughs> like the end of a theatre performance, yeah, no, about, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I always remember Monkey Island as well, like Monkey Island One and Two. 
they were obviously big games for adventure games to beat. Yeah. And I remember like Monkey Island 2 in particular. I came on like 15 discs or something back then. But there was a cheat where, and I discovered this by accident once, because I paused the game and I couldn't figure out which button it was to unpause mm. it. So just kind of bashed my hand on the keyboard. And a message <laughs> came up going, do you want to win? I was like, Yes, and then I got the end scene. I was like, oh, all right. <laughs> so you can just do Control W, it is apparently. I'm oh, nice. You just win the game. So. Well, I used brilliant. to play uh, Civilization and strategy games quite a lot. And they'd be all about the long time that you're playing yeah. the game. And yeah. you, you, you'd either win it with a cultural or victory defeat. But I'd play it for so long that it would just go, you've got no more time. And it would just cut me off at the end of the game. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be brutal. Like, like your mum. Yeah. 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 You've got to go to bed now, off Ravi. to bed now. Yeah, yeah. That's it. <laughs> I, I imagine a lot of developers didn't imagine that we'd ever finish the games. Mm. They thought you'd probably get them and you play a few hours of them. So I mean, yeah. you think about it, then you have to beat a lot of these games on like three or four lives. Well, a lot of the old specky ones would just break. If you got into the further levels later on, they'd just break. They're like, oh, no one's going to get here. Why bother finishing <laughs> yeah. it? You know? well, it's the same with like, arcade games. and that Yeah, they glitch out the Pac-Man ones, obviously a famous well, example. This is the thing. We've become so spoilt with games recently. So I downloaded Cuphead. Yeah. last week I did as well I haven't played yeah. it yet I've after been, you I've suggested it oh, God, I haven't got past the first <laughs> level <laughs> I've been playing it with my wife which is another story completely <laughs> but I'm so spoiled I'm like this is stupid there's no checkpoints you got to do the whole level you get so far and you get hit and you're out and I'm just like this is ridiculous and I've managed to just beat the first world which we did in one sitting but we were on it for like two hours yeah I, I got close and but, it, <laughs> it's just like not the first level the first world Ravi just to get that right <laughs> 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 which consists of no no I've, I've, I've also had a session sitting there where I've been like with my mate like come on bro we yeah. can do this yeah. we can do it and it had that old gaming feel yeah, of absolutely. like you know we've got to defeat this together and you know. it just yeah it just comes back to that spending the whole weekend trying to complete that one game yeah. on free lives or something ridiculous <laughs> See, even like stuff recently like, like Flappy Bird that's another one of those you just want to play it again and again yeah, and again yeah. I hate Flappy Bird but every time you just want to pick it up and play it again <laughs> and Crossy Road that's another one oh, 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 awful one. Android game <laughs> Don't ever play it. You'd be there for like a week. It's one more go. One more go. Have you seen the big arcade versions of Crossy Road? There? Yeah. There's a giant button that you have to hit. Oh, yeah. It's I've crazy. seen the Flappy Bird one. Yeah. Bang! Yeah. <laughs> so, have you got any games that maybe you completed back in the day and were disappointed by? Or maybe games that had really good endings? I don't think of any, any specific examples. I think I think because I was an Amiga user, all the games were super, super hard and I never really got to complete <laughs> that many. I'd get to like a level and that would be it. That would be completed for me, even though it was four off the end or something. I remember I had a copied disc of um, Mortal Kombat and like when I got the end, the disc was corrupt at the end. <laughs> the game. Never saw the ending. I was like, oh, corrupt I just played with, it for like a cor- week. Yeah. Corrupt with a K. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. So uh, do let us know your favourite game endings if you've got any uh, notable examples. Show at the retrohour.com. Obviously, um, you're a big Sega fan, Joe. Did you know that Sega? Actually, did you know Sega made a, made a virtual reality headset. I do, but I only learned this ten minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I did. Of course, of course. <laughs> well, I actually just um, saw this documentary pop up on my mm. YouTube timeline, and it's not a YouTube channel I come across before, actually. Uh, but it's called um, Wrestling with Gaming. Yeah, and then I subscribe because actually they've got some really good documentaries on this channel. Um, but this is all about Sega's VR headset. Now, this was launched in 1991. Uh, well, that was when it was originally announced, and yeah. it took them a couple of years to make it. Obviously, you know, VR was just kind of taken off well, in like Well, they've done the Master System one, hadn't they? Did the 3D well. glasses. The yeah, three, it's not quite yeah. VR, it's just 3D glasses, though, isn't it? Oh, Which okay. you, you've played before. Oh, it's horrible. Just flashes between the eyes and makes you feel very sick. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like VR. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. But it's, um, yeah, so essentially they, they saw that technology they did on the Master System yeah. and they thought, look, you know, we, we can probably better this. And they had these dreams of doing a, you know, a full-on proper virtual reality yeah. headset yeah. for the uh, Sega Mega Drive. Now, this was actually made and they did have a working unit of this that they displayed at CES uh, back in 1993. And there's a guy there who used to be like, do you remember, obviously in the 90s, um, like, video jockeys on MTV were like the cool guys weren't yeah, they yeah. guy called Alan Hunter he actually did a little um, like kind of exhibition and showed this off on stage let me just play you a little clip here of uh, the demo they showed it's all about what VR is it's like what's VR and they've got this cool kid demoing it <laughs> Suddenly, oh, I'm deep in a future world of fast-paced action. <laughs> wow. You've totally immersed in another world. So radical. <laughs> Calabunga. It's like being there. You're in control of the universe. It's like you've got a movie living in your head. 
You've got surround sound that works. Now, the good thing about this is, it actually looks pretty cool. It's actually based on, like, it looks like something out of Star Trek, like a visor. Mm. Quite like lightweight. Like LaForge's, yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's very that's lightweight. That's what it's actually it's based. Like, yeah. If you watch the video, it says that's what it's based on. It looks awesome, I think. But they're going to release this at $200. Really? Which, 1993. Okay. I think that would have been a success. Yeah. If it was lag-free. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, well. The, there's two, two stories to this, so... There was this one prototype that was made, and it was showed working. Mm. But then, I mean, apparently they had like a release schedule and everything for it. They were advertising it yeah, in magazines. Yeah. There were stories and all that about it. But I'm then, we've not heard more about it. Well, and if you look, at, there are some scans online, the mags that were talking about it, mainly American ones. Yeah. Um, but then all of a sudden, it just kind of vanished from the release schedules in 1994. Although they did make four games for it that were apparently finished and working: um, okay. Nuclear Rush, Iron Hammer, Matrix Runner, and Outlaw Racing, which is kind of like Road Rash meets. Rock and roll racing, apparently. Okay. That's kind of cool. Uh, but <laughs> there are two, two like, claims as to why this got discontinued. Now, Tom Kalinske, you know, obviously used to run Sega. Yeah. You'd imagine he's probably accurate. He said the reason they cancelled it is in testing, it kind of introduced, you know, motion sickness and severe headaches yeah. in users. So that was the reason they didn't. Any seizures? There was well, a lot of seizures back then with VR. Well, that, that's, that's the thing, isn't it? It's because, you know, the technology wasn't really there then, yeah. to be honest. Mm. So that's probably the real reason, health reasons. But at the time, <laughs> Sega claimed to have terminated the project because the virtual reality effect was just too realistic. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, oh God's sake. The public can't handle oh, it. S- yes. oh, oh, Sega. <laughs> that is so 90s Sega, though, isn't it? I know. <laughs> I love it. Oh, jeez. So if you want to check out this video, it's <laughs> We've discovered something and you're just not ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the world might be ready now, Sega. Come on, yeah. release it. Now VR's yeah. big again. <laughs> so if you want to check out that video, it's worth a watch, actually. Really good documentary. I just feel like Tom Kalinske was like the sensible mind yeah. Like he was all, you know, when you watch these videos, he always has like, no, this, the, you know, the 32 acts. I think he was against the 32 acts, yeah. wasn't he? And he has all these like sensible, like things of reason. And I kind of just imagine like some small Japanese cool kid <laughs> who like runs Sega in Japan. He's just, just like, do it, no, Tom. just stop, do it, man. Stop being like, a square. Yeah, go on. <laughs> so, it's too real, man. Yeah. <laughs> you can't handle it. So, I mean, I wonder what happened to that. I wonder if anyone's still, you know, it must be yeah. lurking around somewhere, somewhere in like some dusty warehouse. Well, there's or, all these odd VR like Atari Jaguar VR yeah. and Sega VR and all these ones that didn't come out so maybe there's some guy who's got like all the VR kits at home <laughs> he's just been in virtual reality since yeah. 1993 yeah <laughs> come out one day he's like. just stuck in it <laughs> lawnmower yeah. man style <laughs> told you it was dangerous yeah. <laughs> so if you want to watch his documentary I'll put that in our show notes at theretrohour.com right then I think we should let someone else do the talking for a bit and uh I think it's worthwhile us shutting up for a bit because we have a rather special guest this week. Oh, yes, the absolutely legendary Nolan Bushnell. Oh. A 100th episode. You want to do that since the beginning of the show. <laughs> do you want me to do the epic music in the background? Oh, yeah, Actually, I, I did get some, didn't I? Yeah. There you go. There you go. That sounds like Jurassic Park, doesn't it? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so this week's special guest for the big 100, the father of video games. Can we have a moment for Mr. Nolan Bushnell? And we'll see you next week. <laughs> Ciao. Have you played Atari today? You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is our absolute honour to welcome our special guest for the big episode 100. And they do not come much bigger than this gentleman we have this week. Welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, Nolan Bushnell. It's great to be here, and you're way too kind to me. <laughs> well, we can't wait to get your stories of, uh, you know, Atari and those early days of video games. First of all, though, I, I heard that you started off um, your career doing TV repairs. Is that correct? That's correct. I was very fascinated with, the, with with electricity and everything electronic, and I found out that I could fix most TVs by switching tubes. And so I started a TV repair business when I was about 10 years old. All of a sudden, I found myself making really, really good money just by charging 50 cents for a house call. In those days, a house call was five bucks. And so I felt that I had to have a little bit of an extra incentive for people to allow a 10-year-old kid in the back of their TV set. But I found out that I could really mark the tubes up. And I found a good way to buy tubes cheap. And I had a business and and it funded my ham radio uh, career. I was a ham radio operator, but the radios were expensive for a 10-year-old. Well, ham radio was kind of like the old social network back then, wasn't it? Well, not just that. If you were a geek, you were in ham radio because computers were these things that were uh, 
behind glass panels with a raised floor at the university. Well, where did your interest in gaming start then? You know, I've always played board games. Uh, that started, you know, summers in, in Utah on a, on a blanket under the tree and, uh, you know, playing Clue and Sorry and uh, Monopoly and all that. Uh, but I think the appropriate interest in games was when I worked at the amusement park going through, uh, going to college. And uh, I worked in an amusement park on the, on the Midway. And so I became a full-fledged carnival barker, if you would. And uh, I was good at it. And I became manager of the department. And I had a couple of arcades that reported to me. So I quickly understood the economics of the coin-operated game business. I knew how much a game needed to earn. I knew how much they cost to buy. And that was sort of the the research. And so later on, when uh, I was able to see Space War at the university, I said, boy, if I can put a coin slot on this, it would make money in the arcade. But then you divide the 25 cents for three minutes into a half a million dollar computer, the math didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, talking about those days at your at the amusement park, um, one thing I've always wondered about amusement parks, were the games legit or were any of them like kind of rigged? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a situation where they were rigged, but not the way you think they were. For example, I used to run a game called Tip Em Over which had four bottles on a stand, and all you had to do is tip all the four bottles over and you won a prize. What would happen, you could set the bottles up. It was always winnable, but it was very hard. But if I wanted to give a stuffed animal away, like there were two bottle, there, there were four bottles, two of them were what we called heavies and two of them were lights. And if somebody wanted to, to say, hey, let me feel these, I'd show them both bottles and I'd say, Two of them are lights and two of them are heavies. But what they didn't necessarily know is if I wanted to give an, a stuffed animal away to a particular person, I just put the heavies on the top and the lights on the bottom and, and, a, and a strong breeze would knock them all over. And that was good because what you'd want to do is you'd want to create a winner if you had a big crowd around. And so you'd kind of use it as a psychological tool by giving an animal away at the right time. Well, when did you uh, first see your first kind of computer or get to use one? At the university. You know, we would um, sneak into the computer lab at night. In those days, the way you interfaced with the computer is you'd create a, a stack of Hollow, hollow Earth cards. You'd submit it to the um, to the computer center. They'd run it, and you'd get the results the next day. So you, you, we were doing programming classes and things like that, but you never really got your hands on the computer unless you snuck into the computer lab at night, which is what we do, because they'd leave the computer on all the time, but there would be nobody there. And so we'd just sneak in, not turn the lights on, and do our own thing. So when you first saw Space War, I mean, was that a pretty big turning point in your life? And what did you first think of that game when you saw it? I was mesmerized, I was fascinated, I was smitten. And uh, it, it was clearly a turning point in my life. Were the controls as bad as everybody says? Oh, absolutely. But we didn't know how bad they were. <laughs> <laughs> they were the only controls, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, obviously you created a computer space, which was, I mean, what, what, actually, was that the first coin-op game machine then, was it? That's correct. Yeah. Um, well, how did you go about the, the process of, um, obviously, that was based on Space War. How did you go about making that into a, a coin-operated machine? I actually started down the wrong path. I started down thinking that I would buy, you know, many computers that started getting cheap. And what really triggered me was a... Nova 800 coming across my desk, that stripped down, you could get it for 3500 bucks. I mean, that was massively cheap. And the Nova 800 ran at 800 kilohertz, which we thought was really blindingly fast in those days. And my idea was that I would create the interface to connect to a regular television set, uh, connecting this Nova to a... Uh, uh, to a regular TV, because the regular com 
computers were, if they had a display, they were vector graphics and they were, uh, you know, like 10000 to $20,000 at the time. So I knew that didn't work, but you could buy a regular TV for 90 bucks. And so I felt that if I could get the computer to talk to a regular TV, I probably had an opportunity. And, and the thing that was neat about that is in building the interface circuitry, I was able to start creating these little circuits that would take care of some of the housekeeping displays like, uh, like score and the star field and things like that, leaving the computer the only job to really update the position of the rocket ships and the, uh, and the missiles at Al. But even at that slimmed down, the computer kept running out of time. And, uh, you know, it just wasn't fast enough to keep up with things at video rates. Well, obviously, you know, you, you learned a lot of lessons from that. And, um, you know, arguably the most famous video game ever uh, came along shortly after. What was the story behind Pong? Pong happened, again, I feel like an editor, editor and a copier more than an inventor. You know, we'd, I'd been in the video game business for about two years. And um, I'd just gotten a contract, and my idea for Atari was that we were going to be a research organization and that we would provide designs to the big guys that already that had factories and, and get a royalty. That was the, the original business model. Well, I'd gotten a contract, and uh, I had hired my first engineering hire. Up to then, I'd done it all myself and my, my uh, partner, Ted Dabney. Um, Ted did all the analog stuff and I did all the digital stuff. I had heard that all of a sudden somebody had a video game and I said, Oh shit, I've got competition now. So I went up to Burlingame and I, had, and I saw the Magnavox Odyssey game and I looked at it and I said, boy, this is really crappy. Uh, no competition here because it, it was fuzzy and the, the, it had no score and no sound and, uh, could turn the knob and and direct the ball after you'd hit it. I mean, it was just a lot of things that were wrong with it. But I looked around, and there were several units that were set up and people that were there, and they were having fun with it on this simple ping-pong game. So I drove back, and that was Al Alcorn's first day. And so I thought, gee, that's a really simple game. It would be a really good thing for him to learn the technology on um, because we were going to be working on a big hockey game that – had a lot of moving parts to it. And, um, and I gave him a week, and he came up with Pong in a week. And uh, it was kind of fun, and we did some modifications, and it got more fun, and then we did some more modifications, and it even got more fun. And I thought to myself, gee, maybe I can give this to my uh, – I had a contract with Bally. I said, maybe this will fulfill our contract, you know, six months early. And so I flew back, and uh, and uh, they were equivocal about it because it was only a two-player game, and coin-op in those days always required a, a single-player mode. And so they basically turned it down. And and while I was back there, they had taken a version of Pong and put it in a cabinet and put it in a local bar, and it just burned the house down with earning so much money. and. That's where the, the famous story of the unit quit working because it took so many quarters that the uh, uh, coin mech got jammed. And uh, that was true. And so I looked at how much it was making, and I said, geez, I can build these myself. And I decided to do it. Was it the uh, simplicity of the game Pong that made it a massive success compared to, say, Space War? No question about it. Uh, it was the right thing to do at the right time because people didn't know about video games and it was trivial to learn and yet it was a fun game. And so it was a, it was the proper entry point. And I hear the uh, kind of original arcade machine had a few um, domestic things in there like a, a bread tray to collect the coins, <laughs> I remember hearing. That's correct. <laughs> you know, we were, you know, we were really making it up as we go along because we, we really didn't have any tooling. Um, we were buying off the shelf coin mechs and off the shelf TVs. Like we had, um, we'd buy a regular TV, strip off the back, 
strip out the the tuner, hook in directly. You know, we had dumpsters full of extra TV antennas and stuff like that. It was, you know, like I say, we were making it up. <laughs> <laughs> like like a milk carton for the coins as well, wasn't it? <laughs> exactly. And I also heard that uh, the serial numbers, there may have been a bit of differences to put the uh, competition off. Yeah, we, we always want felt that we, want, we didn't want our serial numbers to give a clue as to what the, uh, how many we were actually making. So I think we, we skipped every 500. I don't know if anybody ever figured out that there were never any units that ended up in, in the, you know, 700, 745 or 1,800. Well, what was the real story with that, with key games? Was that a subsidiary of Atari? That's correct. In the coin-operated business, there was essentially a major distributor, or two major distributors in every city. And they had exclusive relationship, like one distributor would have the Gottlieb line, the other one would have the Williams line of pinballs. And Atari, we were small, but we were really the best, you know, everybody wanted the Atari line and uh, or a video game line. And I thought that, you know, all the the distributors that didn't have the Atari line wanted a, a line and they would be out trying to pump up anybody who looked like they might be a competitor to us. And so I decided, hey, let me fill that demand by my own competitor. And so I asked one of my uh, good friends, you know, start a company. We'll give you uh, the number two man in our engineering department. We give you the number two man in our manufacturing department. And you start up as a startup. And, uh, And we took some of the designs that were already you know, partially completed at Atari, and we set him up, and he went to the trade show and chose all the distributors that that we didn't have. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to keep it a secret for a long time, so I said that he'd stolen a bunch of our employees and that, and we sued him, and that we'd had a, a, uh, you know, there was no internet in those days, so nobody could check on the fact that you were fabricating a story. Yeah. (laughs) Good tactic, though. Very good. And uh, and I said that we'd uh, become a part owner as a settlement, and then we said we'd become the majority owner, and then along the line we said we decided to to buy the shares that we didn't already have and become a wholly owned subsidiary, and they'd had a couple of pretty hit games by that time. And so our distributor wanted the key games line, and the key games distributors wanted the Atari line. So we said, uh, well, I'll give you both. And what that did is it gave Atari the only coin-op company that had dual distribution. Well, speaking of Atari, I mean, the, um, the ethic at Atari at the time was work hard, play hard, I've heard, and keep them separate. What was it like in those early days? It was madhouse. Understand that we were 30 miles south of San Francisco, sort of the center of the hippie movement. You know, and uh, the whole idea is don't trust anyone over 30. And all of us executives were in our late twenties, and uh, and so we decided that it was sort of our responsibility to create a new kind of company, and we decided that that new company would be characterized by non by a focus on outcomes and not process. We thought that process was what the man did, and and we didn't want to be just like the man, and. Uh, that's where we said you can wear anything you want. You can come to work when you want to. The only thing you have to do is complete your job. And if you don't do, do your job, um, and we're going to treat you like an adult, if you don't do your job, we fire you. And if you do good, do a good job, we're going to reward you with additional pay and parties. And since everybody was young, parties were actually probably as important as the pay. I can imagine that spurred a lot of kind of creativity and especially if you were making kind of total brand new games and ideas, it would be a good to have that culture. And it, it had the other advantage that we could literally hire the best of the best engineers. And so we probably had engineers that were smarter and more capable than than Intel and and IBM at the time, because everybody wanted to work for Atari because it looked like a blast. 
Well, where did the idea of a home system, the, the Atari 2600, where did that come from? That was Al Alcorn. And Al was a guy who was excessively curious. Or no, he was, you can't be excessively curious. You, 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 know, you want to be, at, have people that are absolutely as curious as possible. And he was always tracking new developments. And there had a technology came along that was called in-channel MOS. The reason in-channel was important is because it was fast. It could, uh, chips in those days really started topping out at about a, a megahertz. The in-channel could go faster than that. And yet it was large scale integration. And so he thought, hey, I can put a Pong on this and, and have it work on this chip. And that made it cheap enough to take essentially the circuitry of a coin-op Pong and put it in a box and sell it to the home. And that's really where it started. Did you have any kind of idea that um, the 2600 would spawn such a kind of entire industry, and you know, a massive industry? We thought that it was going to be good. We we knew that people wanted games. And the thing I liked about the the 2600 is that you could sell the consoles for a little bit of money and uh, the cartridges for a whole bunch of money. And so it really allowed us to put an awful lot of current technology into a unit and price it at the at the consumer rates. Well, you did kind of touch before on a, you know, video ping pong. I mean, there's been told that you and Ralph Bear had a bit of a strained relationship. Um, what was kind of the deal there then? Did, did you kind of not see eye to eye very often? Well, it was... It was a thing where I always felt that that uh, he liked to claim that he invented Pong. And he didn't. He invented Odyssey. Pong and, and that was a very different game. And for him to claim that he invented the coin up or the, the ping pong game, the video ping pong game, was 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 baloney. And of course he'd done some he he, he was kind of a patent troll and he sued me early on for patent infringement. We settled out of court, but it just always kind of pissed me off. And, uh, and so, um, you know, even, you know, as, as late as probably 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if you went on to, uh, his webpage, he'd say he invented Pong. And of course he didn't. You, you, you claim what you do. He invented Odyssey and I improved on it. And I never disputed the fact that uh, that uh, that game at that time was inspiration for it. You know, th there was this other thing. I always said, hey, you know, we should talk about this on a on a panel sometime. And uh, he'd never go. But that's just another story. I even heard, like, you know, the game Simon was actually an Atari idea, was it? That's correct. Um, and that's that, that was actually my invention. Um, and... Uh, he copied it and patented it and sold it to Milton Bradley. Wow. But shame on me. I should have th thought about taking it to the toy business, but I didn't. So shame on me. Well, Simon was one of those kind of fantastic repetitive action things. And now that's kind of embedded in a lot of games as well, actually. So it's quite a pioneer, Simon was. Well, it was a fun game. And, uh, and we, you know, our, the Atari version was a thing called Touch Me. And it was the idea of, can we do an electronic game that doesn't have a video screen? And it was it was modestly successful. Well, speaking to people who you worked with, who obviously went on to be huge successes, you hired a young Steve Jobs and Wozniak. What was the story of you initially working with those guys, and what did you see in them at the time? I always tried to hire for passion and enthusiasm. And uh, Jobs actually showed up and said, I'm not leaving until you hire me. And um, he was hired on as a tech, not as an engineer. He came in to me one time and said, you know, Nolan, you've got a great, great company. I had an open door policy. Anybody could come in and chat with me. And uh, he says, but nobody here knows how to solder. And I said, really? And he brought in a, a circuit board and showed me all the cold solder joints. And I said, boy, that's... That those are going to cause failures in time because, you know, if it's a cold solder joint, the, it oxidizes and, and, you know, causes a failure, sometimes two or three years down the line, but it's, 
but inevitably. And I said, well, you know, why don't you set up a school and show him? Because he showed me his soldering items, and evidently his dad had shown him how to solder. And Steve was always meticulous. And he literally changed, you know, taught the people. And I think he was responsible for a lot of the the um, high ratings we got on reliability. Well, initially, I mean, did, did he approach you to turn his computer design into a product, didn't he? Was that, and you turned them down? Yeah, I did. I've, uh, I could have owned a third of Apple computer for $50,000. I've often regretted that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I bet. But, you know, it's, it's, it, you, know you never know what, what happens because the guy who uh, took my place and did invest was Mike Markla, who was the first president of Apple. And I think that he was very, very instrumental in the success of Apple in the early days. Well, what effect do you think video games have had on the development of personal computers in general? Well, I think we definitely have spearheaded and forced graphics to improve much faster than they would otherwise. Because if you really look at, at all the things that, uh, you know, in terms of graphic cards and graphic capability, things like that, it was all spurred by uh, by the video game business. But, but I also believe that video games are in fact the training wheels of computer literacy. I know of not a single decent programmer that isn't a avid game player, or at least started that way. And so I think that uh, it's normal to be willing to play games and cause effects on the screen. And pretty soon it's a small step to learn how to actually program. Well, obviously, you know, when you were at Atari, it must have been a very busy time. Did, did you get much time to sit down and play the games yourself? And did you have any favorites? Oh, yeah. I, I love Breakout. I love Tempest. I love uh, a lot of stuff that uh, was really an important part. I Temp, Tempest and, and uh, Missile Command. and Yeah, I loved them all. Was selling to Warner a mistake? Did you regret that later? Yes and no. I mean... The reality is that we didn't have enough capital to really pursue the 2600. It required a very different and bigger factory, required a lot of tooling, and I needed to raise money and the stock market was not really ready to take a IPO. We That was actually the direction. And so I'm not sure if we, I think we could have probably sort of limped into production on the 2600. Um, without Warner, but we made a much better impact with Warner's money uh, at that time. So, you know, in some ways, I've been pretty happy with my life. Um, I think that there were several projects that were were killed by Warner that I I loved. I've often thought that I might have been able to own the internet because we I wanted to do a uh, a telephone link game playing system so that you could play people over the telephone line and they killed that. They didn't think anybody would want to do that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, think that once you had that game playing network that it would have evolved into the internet. Maybe not. But uh, but it was one of the it's one of those things that in the back of my mind I'll always have a question about. And then of course they sold me Chuck E. Cheese because I'd started Chuck E. Cheese inside at Warner. And uh, I actually made more money on Chuck E. Cheese than I did on Atari. You know, before you left Atari, I mean, how, did you have much involvement in the Atari 400 and 800? Yes. I mean, it was pretty much done uh, design-wise by the time I left. You know, it was clearly a much better computer than the Apple II. Um, we had sprites. We had all kinds of cool things. I mean, there were no custom integrated circuits in the Apple II, and we had three. And it was really a good, good, good computer. But Warner, by that time, was just smitten with the cartridge business, and they thought that the, the computer was just another record player. And so where Jobs was out evangelizing people to write software for the Apple II, Atari was saying, if you write software for the Apple, for the Atari, we'll sue you. And so Atari didn't have a spreadsheet, which was responsible for a huge 
number of uh, Apple II sales, and um, and was ultimately dominated by by Apple because uh, be just because of software. I mean, software sells computers. Computers don't sell computers. Well, speaking of making software on the machine, I heard a story that Alan Miller. Uh, took over doing the basic because uh, Bill Gates and Microsoft took too long to make it? I, I, I think that's probably true. I was not a, aware of that at the time, but I think that's probably true. He must have been the only guy to ever sack Bill Gates, if so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, we had the operating system in a cartridge in the Atari 800 because we were afraid that our operating system would, would be buggy and we'd need to be able to change it. <laughs> Well, we were fantastic Amiga fans, and uh, what was it like working with Jay Miner? Brilliant man, and a kind man, really a good guy. Um, and how we got Jay was we allowed him to bring his dog with him, and because uh, he was in, absolutely in love with this little dog. And so we didn't want to let everybody bring their dog, so we basically hired the dog <laughs> and made a little badge for it that he hung on his collar and the dog could come in. And people say, hey, I want to bring my dog. He said, I don't think your dog, I don't think we want to hire your dog. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been interesting when the tax man came around. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, why did you decide to leave Atari in the end then? What was the, the thing that made you decide to move on? I think that once you are the head of a company and, uh, and you're – crafting the strategies and all of a sudden you're surrounded by people that don't have the vision and don't have the understanding and are quote unquote suits it becomes very frustrating and uh and they just didn't get they didn't understand the future and i just got tired of fighting with them did you keep an eye on the on the company afterwards and was it kind of sad to see the demise of it then oh yeah i made more money shorting warner stock i could see them heading for the cliff um, just by not reinventing themselves. And I felt that they needed to obsolete the 2600 three years before because the 2600 was very memory deficient. We only had 128 bytes of RAM, not kilobytes, bytes, 128 bytes of RAM because memory was very expensive. Two years later, you could get literally a thousand times more memory for the same cost. And that just, you know, unloaded the computer. It, 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 it gave you graphics that were basically pixel-based than rather than those quarter-inch blocks that you had to do on the 2600. Well, obviously, Atari took a big change under Jack Jamil. They went more computer-focused, didn't they, later? Yeah, I mean, Jack was a manufacturing guy, and he felt that he could do everything just by building something cheap and selling it at a lower price than anybody else and didn't understand how brands and fashion and that sort of thing goes by. And when he ultimately sold it to a disk drive company and turned it into a disk drive manufacturer, shows that his heart really wasn't in the game business. Yeah, a lot of people thought you only bought Atari really to kind of destroy Commodore. Well, I think that that's part of it. And that was the center of gravity of who he was. He was a computer guy not realizing that the lifeblood was really well the common thread at that time said that the com the video game business was over because the 1983 debacle decimated so many retailers the biggest single page loss of uh, any product at Sears Roebuck stuff like that and then of course three years later Nintendo came in and just swept up the market hey you got involved in robotics with Androbot in the uh, mid-80s. Uh, what happened there? Too soon. Uh, too big a, a bite. This was before uh, you had true multitasking operating systems. The, the sensors were cruddy and crude. I just thought that I could create a better robot with the technology that was available, and I couldn't. And uh, it was a technical failure. Um, and uh, we we went to a trade show and sold a whole bunch of them, but couldn't actually build what we tra what we showed. Lost a lot of money, a lot of my poor personal fortune on that. I mean, you're right about the fact that it, you know it was just too early. Because I mean, you look today, and we've got stuff like our Roombas, you know, vacuum cleaners, and kind of household robots have now become a thing. So I mean, you must have been quite a visionary to see that at the time. I actually think 
we still haven't gotten a home robot. There's a Roomba, there's various things, but there isn't a little guy running around helping you. Some, one of these days we'll have that. That's still on my bucket list. <laughs> Well, you know, we did mention Commodore briefly when we are talking about Jack, but you actually worked with Commodore in the early 90s. I, I saw you were promoting their um, CDTV product. They called me in to consult with them, and, um, and it was a fun project. Um, I felt that it was a, a good project. I liked the technology. Um, it was one of the early delivery, you know, the early systems that used a CD which is relatively new technology. But I could, again, I couldn't get them to do the right economic model. And the right economic model was to figure out a way to make money on, on the uh, CDs by having a surcharge and discount the player. The problem with CDTV is by not taking a smaller margin on the hardware, we never got enough units out there to uh, attract uh, software developers. And so it, it was kind of a chicken and egg failure. And uh, it, it, could have been a, it could have been a next powerful console. Well, what do you think of the video games industry today? You know, it's quite split up where you've got indie developers and you've got big commercial houses. I think it's great. Um, in fact, I'm actually in the process of spinning up a, uh, a game company. I've sort of been out of the game company business for a while, but I just think there's never been more opportunity. The whole idea of in-app purchases and, uh, and uh, we're going to be integrating uh, some things using the blockchain um, uh, because I think that with cryptocurrencies, you can do such seamless transactions and um, and I feel like there's an opportunity to do some new innovations that, uh, you know, next quarter, you know, first quarter of next year, we're going to be uh, releasing some things that I think will be quite novel. I heard that you're not um, a fan of violent game franchises like, uh, like Grand Theft Auto and those kind of games. That's correct. I, I just feel like... Separate what I'd call, you know, League of Legends and, and World War II and some of those those games that have some violence in it. I mean, war is violence. But I felt like Grand Theft Auto kind of glorifies antisocial behavior. And I just feel like, you know, we are what we eat. And we, we gain the mentality of those things that we uh, look at. And, and act. And I, I think acting the criminal is not necessarily good for society. So I just basically say I don't, uh, I don't endorse that. And then if I don't, I'm reluctant to let my kids do something, uh, then I feel like I have to speak out against it in public. Yeah, there's a kind of difference, isn't there, between the uh, psychotic kind of violence of like Gears of War versus something where you can actually you know, it's historically accurate and you're kind of put into that situation. Exactly. Well, in 2010, um, you returned to, like, the new Atari on the board of directors. Are you still involved there at all? And have you seen stuff like the Atari Box project? You know, I'm still... Um, I'm not on the board anymore. Um, I'm actually... Uh, you know, I, I'm going to um, be talking with them later on this week about the, uh, the new Atari Box, and I may have some involvement but it's mostly kind of advice and sometimes being a spokesman. But uh, I'm getting so I'm, – I'm, you know, I, I'm old enough that I should be retiring. And uh, people keep trying to get me into, involved in things, and I, I tend to say yes, and I shouldn't. <laughs> keep getting pulled back in. You know? <laughs> well, I mean, it must have been – you know, obviously when that Atari Box project was announced, I mean, you must have seen all the press – going wild about it and all the gamers have been so excited to see that iconic logo and the brand name back on a console again. Yeah, and, and I think that that's, you know, the um, people are looking for something new and unique. And, you know, like the Nintendo Switch is, 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 a, is actually a pretty interesting product right now that's getting a, a, lot, of, a lot of traction. And, uh, you know, 
bringing it Nintendo back from the brink again. Uh, you know, the, the the Nintendo Wii U was really crappy. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's a, uh, yeah, I, I want all game publishers and, and platforms to do well. Uh, have you seen a kind of resurgence in the interest in Atari, especially with stuff like E.T. Game Over coming out? Yeah, I think um, there is no question that Atari, as a nostalgia brand, being the first for a lot of things, that's a big help. But also, the icon is really good. When you think, when you really look at it, the icon is really good. Mm. And uh, and I think that sometimes just a good piece of artwork can take on a life of its own. And uh, a lot of the iconic games that we created were really good gameplay. We couldn't rely on good graphics, so we really had to make sure timing and the tensioning of the game was was right and so in some ways the nostalgia album the, the or, um, movement is really a a uh, affirmation of how good the games were well here's a question that um might, might be interesting according to you what makes a good video game i think the number one thing that you always have to play with is this whole idea of balancing risk and reward. You want the game, you want the player to beat itself, to beat themselves as much as possible through decisions that they can say, oh shoot, I shouldn't have done that. Um, Any idiot game designer can crank up the speed to where even Superman can't play the game. That's what I call the cheap fail. And that's frustrating and that's irritating. But if you offer a big prize, but in order to go for the greedy shot, you have a higher probability of, of losing a life, that's the right way to do it. It's, it's that risk-reward balance that is, is, is quite attractive. Well, you've also been involved in the world of virtual reality, and I've just got a HTC Vive, so I'm just entering that world myself. Um, what do you think about it? I think that it is the closest thing to the holodeck <laughs> that we can do. Yeah, totally agree. <laughs> remember, an awful lot of ga- gameplay is about fantasy, about losing yourself into this synthetic world. And what VR does is puts you in the center of that world in a very, very unique and powerful way. Um, the only issue I have right now is I'm not sure that um, VR is ready for prime time in as much as I can't see myself in the goggles for hours and hours at a time. I I see it in the arcades for the next few years, but I think that um, the the goggles need to get really light. They need to to deal with uh, just the comfort issue. Uh, as well as I still think uh, there's microscopic lagging, which uh, can lead to motion sickness. I think it's close, but I don't think it's there yet for mass adoption on a consumer basis. Yeah, if you've ever had VR crash on you, it's a very strange experience. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I've had that in spades, I can tell you that. <laughs> well, I think you're right. I mean, eventually it's got to get to the stage where you've got a wireless pair of, like, glasses that you put on, that's it. Precisely. Mm. And then, then, then it'll really take off. Uh, there's also, you know, I, I believe that, in fact, a whole kit needs to be sub-$300. Yeah. And... Uh, it's not there yet. Well, Nolan, there's a couple of guys who've played video games all of our lives. You know, it's um, just been amazing to get your stories and, you know, talking to the guy who founded the industry. It's just incredible for us both. So we appreciate you joining us this week. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been marvelous. My pleasure. And, you know, best of luck to you. I, uh, I believe keeping the, the video game uh, world and the gaming world alive uh, is an important service. And I thank you. Thank you.